Oh, howdy. Today we're going to be looking at this Gerda HSS 9 disc disc detainer lock where the top uh, disc is a spinner. It's gated as well, so it does need to be set, but yeah, can't tension from it. This is actually a rear tensioning lock, but we're going to use front tensioning for all the discs until the end, and then we're going to swap the front disc for the rear disc so that we can get this open. So we can take a look here at the fact there are nine discs. Yes, the brass colored inserts there are the spacers. And the top disc again, that spinner disc that you see there uh, is gated. We'll look at how that affects the lock, but it can't be tensioned from. So how are we going to do the tensioning? We'll take a look at a moment. So what we're going to do in this video, there's a few things today. Is uh, First off, we're going to look at what are the discs actually doing? how the pick works in that disc stack. We'll do a demo. We'll look at how to use a fail in an open and disc detainers to help us get the ideas of how they work. And then we're going to put it all back together. So what are those discs doing inside the lock? Well, first thing we can take a look at is the key against the stack. And we can see that we've got zero cuts on one and five. You'll see what zero cuts mean in a sec. but. As they travel, the zero cuts move first and fastest and head right to the cuff where the actuator is sits. That's what's being held in place in the vise. So now we're in the unlocked position when we get there. We'll see what that looks like in a second, just to get a sense of how those disc tabs move back and forth in the lock. And it's those tabs that stop the disc from over rotating. So there they are all lined up. And when they're all lined up, the sidebar can move in, the actuator cuff can turn, the lock will open. Nope, that's the neutral position. When you put the key in and here's when the key is turned. Fantastic. Here's kind of what the inside view looks like is that as the uh, discs turn, they're hit towards a uh, the sidebar to be open, the open gate, there's a false gate, little gate, there's a true gate, bigger, so the sidebar fits in, but the false gates feel like they're set, but they're not. And so when they're all set, as we'll see here, the actuator turns around, and when it turns around, um, well, the lock will open, we'll look at that in a sec, but just to get a sense of that sidebar falling in when the key turns and Everything's lined up nice now when it's clean like that. It can clear the inside of the lock and turn. Well, here's another view. Look to the top and you'll see the sidebar drop in. And that's the state it needs to be in to open the shackle. And just for a fun fact, this is why you can't pull out a disc detainer key once you've got the key inside and the lock is open. Because, of course, as those bits turn, they form a new pattern on the inside. They crisscross on top of each other, becoming from a rectangle when you look straight in like that to a kind of a diamond shape and those smaller diamonds hold the key inside. Here's another way to look at this. When you see the deep cut in the key, look at how long it takes for the rest of the key at that point to catch up with the lock, which is why that disc, where it is, doesn't make it all the way to the other side of the cuff because it has to kind of wait until the part of the key that can actually turn that disc catches up with it. So there's a lag and its throw, how far it throws before it's in its gate is very small versus this is a zero cut disc number five in this case, which when it goes in, you'll see that it fits the shape of that opening really well. And so as soon as the key is in at that disc, it just starts to turn that disc. No lag at all because, well, basically it fits. Now watch the disc uh, tab here is going to hit the collar of the stack of the cuff and it can't go any further. So that's a disc we'll be able to tension off because it turns early, gets there first, the zero guts do, and can be used for tension while we then move the slower other discs. So this is what happens in front tensioning. We adjust the pick tip into that first disc. We'll get the second disc in this case, which is what we're doing by adjusting the pick tip because that first disc is a spinner. So we need to get tension on the front of the second disc. Now we can move the other discs while that front disc is tensioned. You can see the other discs in the stack are being moved by the pick tip while we hold tension on the first one. We'll just go through the stack, popping the, if there were a side gate in there, that would be popping them into their gate to align it to be able to turn 
that actuator in order to open the lock. And when all the disks are set, we're ready to go to that disk eight. We set tension on now disk one, that's a zero cut disk, and then counterclockwise rotate eight into its disk. When it's set, we're gonna pull out uh, the front bit a bit to catch the spinner and then move it in a clockwise direction. And if all things being equal, that would open the shackle. We're gonna see in a second how that shackle opening actually works with the actuator spinning around. So here's the actuator between the ball bearings and when it's uh, in its closed position you can see that the ball bearings are held into the shackle and those cutouts but when you turn the key and the lock you get this narrowing of that part of the actuator. The ball bearings can slide in and the lock opens. So let's take a look at an actual pick and gut of this lock. Key test, you can see, again, nine discs, including a spinner. I'll set the discs clockwise. This isn't quite long enough to get the back two, so sometimes I have to set one manually, and sometimes it's one and two manually. Just wait to feel. Now I've extended the tip on the, the tool a little bit, so again, it will catch that second disc on the front, that's disc eight, for tensioning initially. Get the pick all the way in to get to, first of all, setting that zero disc at disc one, checking on disc two to find its gate. Yeah. Oh, there's a click. Disc five, so that's zero cut. Is six, little click, and then a bigger click. Oh, there it is. And one more. Yeah, it's a deeper sound almost. Disc seven. That that sometimes these discs are so close to where they already are, but they're not. So you have to kind of again test them. Just go back and forth on the gates. A heuristic for disk detainers with false gates is just get it into a gate and then play with it to find the true gate feel versus the false gate feel. We'll see in an example that that's uh, not always as easy as it should be. Now this one feels set, so going back and I'm going to swap the tension holding the first disk and then turning back to get the right uh, uh, true gate for eight. That could be it. Lots of play there. Clicked in. Take it out, spin forward on disc nine, but it, it it's too loose, it's soggy, so nothing happens. What are you gonna do? I'm gonna retighten up the front tension and walk through the discs in the pack again, just to check, are they really set in their true gate? So that's what's happening here. Is it taking them out of a gate, putting them in a gate, going out of, because sometimes the false gate, if you look on the discs, can be before the true gate, sometimes it's after the true gate. You get a sense of that from trying it out and moving up the stack again. Five, I think that's going up, yep. Yeah. Maybe it's six. Clicking it down into the true gate. Yeah, that was a double click there. Big one on that. And again, seven, checking it. So that's starting to feel like back and forth that that should be right. So it should be going to ah, yeah, the front. Yeah, because that's as far back as it can go. So we'll go to the front to grab that zero cut disc. Rechecking that seven disc can be a killer. So I'm just setting that a couple of times. I think that's because the gate is so close. There's very little play between the clockwise position and 
going back to counterclockwise, it's really easy to go into the false gate. So trying to grab that first gate again, hold that zero cut disc now, going back, oh yeah, that's harder to get into that gate, so there's a more solid feel for setting disc gate. Gonna come up on oh, that is hard to push disc nine. That's a good sign. Not always, but it's a good sign. Oh, tension slipped off. So just gonna recover tension on disc one. And push on disc nine by turning the key and voila. It's open. Okay, we can check out these discs. I'm going to go a little quickly through opening up the lock. Not to take up your time, it just unscrews at this point. Um, you can use a washer here as well to unscrew this big enough washer. It's just a gut wrench. And the interesting thing here is that uh, taking out the cap really jammed in disc 9. It's still in, in uh, the open position, which uh, at this point is fine because it wasn't relying on that disc at that point to do anything. But now you can see that the sidebar is well and truly in. That is moved out of the side groove, which you can see down at the bottom of the lock there. And in a sec, I'll push it back into, there you go. Now it's in the uh, locked position manually push that around because everything's lined up you can manually push the collar and the actuator around and that drops off the shackle jam the shackle back in lock it back up and start taking out the discs and the uh, spacers and when we get looking at these you'll see again the false gates Oh, I love that disc 5. It's got two false gates on it, but it's a zero cut, so when you put it fully clockwise, you don't touch the false gates. So I'll just get the rest of these out here, and we'll take a look at them. Right, only D1 has no false gate. Here goes the shackle, the ball bearings, easy peasy. And just a quick view at the... It's funny, when it's not in the right position, it can be hard to see those little bitty chunks of false gate. So we roll them around, it's a little easier to see. But they're there, except in disc one, and the spinner doesn't have any false gates. Doesn't have a tab either. Which is, of course, why it can just go round and round. There's the grub screw, the collar. We'll put that in shortly. All right. Now, you're going to notice uh, on this picture of the discs that there's marker all over them. This is permanent marker just so that I know the order of the discs when I take it apart and they fall all over the place. It is completely possible to reconstruct the lock, no problem, but having markers and numbering can help. Now, here's a look at Another thing that can help, which is a failed open. Cool thing about a disc detainer lock is that you can see the state of the lock from the stack, how it's set, uh, assuming it's a lock that you can take apart, like this one is. And especially when you feel like everything is set, going right, and then it's not because it's not opening. So what can you actually do at this point? Well, you can go back and forth a hundred million times. But what I've found to be really helpful here is to pause and to take a look at what's going on inside to see if what I think I'm feeling is actually what's going on in the lock to help connect the visual and uh, tactile senses together. So that's what's going to happen here is this is lock was not opening take a look at the state of the lock. And it was a surprise. It was uh, definitely everything in a gate, just not the right gate.
Okay, so here's that technique of using a washer just to open this up. And the idea here is going to be to let's take a look, get rid of that spinner, pull out the spacer, and start to look at the discs. And I popped that one out too fast, but what I can tell you is that it was definitely an eight ball skate, not a true gate. Okay, we'll take a look at this a little bit quicker and you can see that we've got lots of uh, false gates here. Move this lock around in a sec. There you go. So you can see clearly that where that sidebar is, is sitting in a false gate. So the lock felt sufficiently set to give that front spinner a bit of tension, which is usually the indicator it's ready to go. But no, the lock was actually sitting a lot of gates, a lot of discs rather, in false gates. This is why when that happens to go back through the stack and test again just going back and forth on the disk to see is this really the true gate that it's in if it doesn't feel like it's setting move on to the next one come back and uh, that's what happened in the demo that you saw and so th this approach is really useful again to help get that kinesthetic uh, experience with the visual to help learn what this lock uh, feels like. And it does seem to transfer to looking on other locks too. So um, one other quick thing to finish up with is how we get the grub screw back in. Is It's behind the shackle to open that cap. So uh, when you open the lock and the shackle drops, you want to set that core so that it's absolutely vertical so that the Grub screw can go into the little hole that it's got in the cap for that. You have to make sure that that grub screw goes in all the way because it needs to get out of the way of the shackle, which you see here. And then as soon as that's done, the shackle can clear that area and you can lock the lock up and there you go. You're good to go again. So yes, there you have it. The Gerda HSS, a really super cool rear tensioning to front tension lock. Hope that was helpful for you. If you have questions, let me know. Thank you.